What's up, everybody? My name is Sam, and this is the Internet Where Things Happen. Today uh, is a continuation of our uh, Halloween week festivities. As you have seen this week, we've done some fun stuff for the spooky season, as it were. And one of the things that uh, people associate with spook is the, um, the legendary tales of one H.P. Lovecraft. Um, and... I wanted to talk to somebody who I knew knows a lot about the Lovecraft mythos and all of the things contained therein. So I got my friend Zach to come and talk to me again. Zach, hello. Welcome back. Thank you for having me back, Sam. Of course. Of course. I Listen, I... <laughs> You, uh, I have, I have different, I have correspondence on my channel, and you are my my correspondent of Spook. That's your official title. <laughs> I, I accept it with great humility, and I want to thank the Academy. And <laughs> <laughs> and he's looking, and he's looking very dapper, and as he said before we started recording, very dandy today. And I, yes, I really appreciate yes, that. indeed. Since uh, since Lovecraft was uh, doing most of his work during the twenties and thirties, and most of his stories take place around that time i figured i might as well dress the occasion and be a, a proper yeah. man about town for the time yes, of course of course meanwhile i am wearing my uh my <laughs> my pro wrestling best friends tag team t-shirt so that's really <laughs> we're really on brand today <laughs> so i guess the first question would be to ask who was H.P. Lovecraft? What was his deal? <laughs> <laughs> so, H.P. Lovecraft, uh, Howard Phillips Lovecraft, uh, he was born into a relatively well-to-do uh, upper-middle-class uh, family in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, he was a very prolific writer, uh, both of short stories and of uh, letters between all his fellow artists. Uh, most of his works you can find uh, in any bookstore, uh, especially Barnes & Noble, who happens to sell all of his works contained into one fantastic uh, hardback book. And he was, I guess, the elephant in the room to get out of the way when talking about H.P. Lovecraft is... This was a man who was born at the end of the 19th century and grew up into the early half of the 20th century. He was a problematic racist, even by the standards of his time. Mm -hmm. And some of that did work its way into his stories. Uh, but towards the end of his life, he did start to move back on that after he finally got married and began to travel a bit. Uh, he started to dial it back a bit <laughs> as he started to see more <laughs> of people and started seeing the error of his ways. Mm. But uh, with that out of the way, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft is very much, I would say, kind of the father of modern horror. He kind of bridged mm. that gap between uh, like Victorian Gothic horror uh, that like Edgar Allan Poe is so well known for to the kind of horror that we get today where it's more of kind of like uh, his brand of horror is this very existentially dr existential dread inducing kind of raw yeah, terror. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I associate it with is just like it's very like, it's not like jump scare horror, it's not no. like cheap horror, it's very like deep cerebral like something's wrong horror. <laughs> yes. Yes, there, there's a lot of elements of nihilism in a, in his mm -hmm. kind of horror. There's a lot of feelings of utter hopelessness for humanity and our species in the grander scale of the cosmos. Before I, I met you and started, so my, my experience with H.P. Lovecraft and his stories was, as I imagine most, like, most common people in the mainstream know it, is like people know about Cthulhu. Mm -hmm. That's like the one that everybody knows about. If I say Cthulhu to somebody, it's like, oh yeah, that octopus guy. Like that's kind of what people think about when you when you bring up like Lovecraft and that kind of that name. And then I kind of started learning more about all the other, you know, eldritch gods and horrors in his pantheon as I started to learn and become friends with you. And then we started playing like the board games that have sprung <laughs> out of uh, the mythology and things of that nature. But Cthulhu is not like it. There's a lot 
to it, right? Oh, yes. Cthulhu is very much just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to <laughs> the, the mythos that bears his name. The Elder Gods is like a a branch of them, right? Like a like a like a tier list, and then like it kind of goes down from there. Like what's like the the breakdown of like the the wild things? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the basic uh, tier tier listing, if you will, of the the beings within the Cthulhu mythos is at the top you have the outer gods, uh, where you have okay. beings like Azathoth, uh Shabnigurath, uh Nyarlathotep and others. Uh, beneath the outer gods are the great old ones, which are going to be mm. beings like Great Cthulhu himself. Uh, they are the great old ones are not so much uh, gods as they are just these vastly monstrous alien beings who are from the most far flung corners of our universe, and in some cases, not even our universe. Uh, mm. They come. They can travel between, you know, dimensions and realities, but they themselves are not on the level of like a god who be. They are just these monstrous, unknowable alien creatures, which to mm. us would still seem like gods. Yeah. And then beneath the great old ones, there are the elder gods, which are kind of off on their own little tangent in regards to Lovecraft's works because they're touched okay. on a little bit in uh, in the dream cycle Lovecraft had like two main themes in his works there was the Cthulhu mythos stories and then there was the dreamlands or the dream cycle and those are still counted within the Cthulhu mythos but they have a very different tone to them uh, and we can probably so, get so what would you say is like like but you say we could probably would would it be good to talk about it now or should we talk about it a little bit later about like the difference between the two? Uh, I'd, I'd say just as a quick overview, the the dreamland cycle uh, focuses on a, a realm of reality that humans can readily access in their dreams. Uh, the okay. dreamlands are this place where when you're young, you can practically enter it at will anytime you want. And the dreamlands are where the elder gods or the earthly gods live. So the gods of all the major religions live there and they hear and try to reply to the prayers of humanity. But ultimately they are powerless in the face of the outer gods. The, the biggest concept of, um, uh, that I have experienced with um, learning about it through you is that like these old ones and the outer gods and all of these gods, like the big theme is that they, people are driven insane by them. And some people seek that out <laughs> <laughs> and the world goes mad. So <laughs> yes. I guess my, my, my question to you for that is why, why, why would somebody seek that out? What are those, who, what are those people called? Uh, so often in the short stories, the, the people who are actively worshipping uh, the outer gods and the great old ones usually just get lumped together as cultists, uh, but uh, they all have their own uh, individual wants and desires and reasons for seeking out the old ones. The most common reason being that humans are fatally curious creatures and the desire for knowledge and power that is beyond the reach of humans is a very alluring draw for them. So they often make pacts with these deities and these beings that they don't quite fully understand, but that they hope they will get some divine ultimate truth or power out of them. Mm. And sometimes they do, but at a very heavy cost. Yes, it's very rare that they're actually going to get what they think they're going to get, and if they do, it's at a completely... It's, yeah. it's a Pyrrhic victory. Yeah. Well, it's like an eldritch monkey's paw, basically. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you're never quite going to get what you want. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just, <laughs> I, um... And that, so, okay, so what would you say, because I think my, my favorite thing about um, about learning about all this with you has been when we play the games and then you have um you have say an enemy type such as a maniac and then you sing she's a maniac by hollow notes 
this because you do. <laughs> what is what is so what is the difference between like a cultist and a maniac? Like how like like how does how do those play together? Uh well I mean from a outsider's perspective, like in, in terms of the lore, if you were in that world, you would you would really have a hard time distinguishing the two. Uh, I would say that if someone has reached the point of maniac, they're basically uh, a no longer functioning cultist. They have probably received some horrific revelation that has just broken their mind and they can no longer carry out uh, the duties that they were doing as a cultist. You've got all these people reaching out to these old ones trying to glean this deeper knowledge about the universe and, and oftentimes... Uh, 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 maliciously succeeding <laughs> or, desper- or desperately failing. And it should also be and- noted that sometimes not all of the cultists uh, willingly sought out uh, the Great Old Ones or the Outer Gods. Sometimes uh, those beings uh, like uh, the key example is Cthulhu who mm-hmm. often reaches out and connects with people through their dreams and start subtly manipulating them and drawing them to him until he eventually has them under their under his full control. Mm-hmm. So not everyone willingly seeks them out. They just get curious by this thing that's drawing them in, and by the time they figure out what's going on, it's too late. <laughs> right. <laughs> so 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 what what is like what is a ritual? Like is are the rituals too Re- like summon these gods and reach out to them different do they differ pretty wildly between each of the the gods or are they relatively similar how was how would how would one in theory reach out to an elder god or uh old one or a or, or can can they can they even summon the outer gods uh well that all comes down to in the mythos it depends on which being you're talking about uh mm. which regional variant of that being's cult is doing the ritual uh the most common running theme in all of them is either some form of blood sacrifice or full-on human sacrifice the details that lovecraft gives are pretty vague at best usually just described as unspeakable atrocities but, I think uh, that might also be for the best, actually. No, I'm, thinking <laughs> I'm sitting here. You're saying like blood, like 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 blood rituals and human sacrifice. I'm just over here, like yeah, makes sense. Just nodding along, like. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's probably for the best that it's not super detailed, right? I guess. Right, <laughs> Unspeakable yeah. horrors. We can kind of talk about some of the more like popular ones then and then kind of expand uh deeper as we need to because of course the one that everybody knows is cthulhu Mm -hmm. um i still have this which is a a gift that you gave me before i actually don't remember the um the reason why you gave it It was like a birthday or like a a going away i I don't know why this was given to me i I think it was i think it was a going away gift right before you moved moved moved, yeah that's what I thought too, but it's it's stuck with me, and it's actually featured on one of my videos before. I asked that somebody the question was asked, "What's the strangest thing you have in your room?" And I said, <laughs> "This Cthulhu." Uh, I I would have so, to sit and think about that question for myself. You got a lot of like pretty strange stuff in your room, like that, like that, like that skull back there. <laughs> oh yeah, she she might oh, be a him contender. Or her. So if you think about like pantheons of like like if you think about like the greek gods or the roman gods or things like that like each god is like the god of something Mm -hmm. is it laid out like that within the lovecraft mythos and the cthulhu mythos and all that stuff or or like is cthulhu the god or the the god of something the old one of something uh for some of the entities they could be considered like a god of a specific thing but a great many of them don't have one specific role that they fill. Uh, Cthulhu, for example, we could probably best liken to Mars. Uh, he would very much okay. be like a god of war because Cthulhu is a conqueror of worlds. And he leads an army of star spawn to conquer other worlds and claim them for his own. Star spawn. 
That's buck wild. Dude. <laughs> I don't think I've ever. I don't think I've ever heard the term star spawn before. But that's metal. <laughs> that's so metal. I love it. Um, so, so he's just kind of like out there conquering, muddling with his brains, trying to get them to do his bidding, basically. Yeah, Cthulhu um, basically has two main roles, if you will, uh, that of a conqueror and that of high priest of the old ones. It's kind of like Cthulhu's main job uh, to wait for the stars to come right to awaken all the great old ones and to subjugate Earth and bring it into, under complete control of the great old ones. The outer gods okay. couldn't much care less because Earth is just nothing to them. <laughs> but for the great old ones, it would be a nice prize. So what are so what are some other um, other like pretty important great old ones we'll start we'll start with we'll start with them and then work our way to the outer gods as we get there uh some of the more important great old ones uh that would be haster uh who Mm. is actually not a creation of lovecraft but was a creation of one of his close friends uh lovecraft uh basically he had a bunch of different friends who were all fiction writers like himself and they would all like uh take ideas from one another and use it in their own stories, which has since kind of been called the Lovecraft game because all these other writers use stuff from his stories in theirs as like a nod to his work. And he, and Lovecraft himself highly encouraged it. And so all throughout his life and even to today, you still get people adding stories into the mythos. So there's always new beings being created and new, uh, I don't want to say canon, but just lore being added. Because canon is a very difficult thing to tack down yeah. in the mythos. <laughs> <But> <laughs> and so so Haster, if I recall correctly, that is, I, I recall that being associated to the king in yellow. Is yes. that correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, Tell ha- me more about Haster. Haster is a great old one who is very prone to affect the minds of creative individuals. Uh, he likes oh, no. seeking out. <laughs> yes, he likes seeking out artists, playwrights, painters, poets, a- anyone YouTubers. who has creative inclinations. Hastur wants to get his tentacles on them because he sure. kind of part of his backstory is that there is a, a play that is performed mm-hmm. on his home world uh, where he is currently imprisoned. But through the repeated performance of this play, he is able to slip further and further out of his bounds. So he affects the minds of creative types to emulate and recreate this play over and over and over again to loosen his bonds so that he can be free. Ooh. Spooky. (laughs) So, So in theory, if you were a person that, say, had this idea last year to make a false a fake documentary about animal crossing for youtube would you say, <laughs> would you say haster would come after that person for having creative inclination uh i That's- i would just I, I would just look through and see how many times are they saying yellow sign in there and if i if i even hear it once that's already going to be a big worry but uh if i okay, start hearing it more one, <laughs> once is too much once is too much two is once is if, is if someone just comes up to you and says have you seen the yellow sign turn around walk away did you, yeah, you don't, don't need don't, to hear anything else that, <laughs> that person's not your friend stop it get some help stop it get some help <laughs> <laughs> Another one that I know the name of, and I could be mispronouncing this, but uh, and one of that I've heard is uh, uh, Merun's Dagon. Is that a is that an uh, old old one or is that an outer god? That is neither. That is that is not. Oh, is, what is who is that? Who is that? <laughs> <laughs> Merun's Dagon is a Daedric prince from the Elder Scrolls series. <laughs> You talk. Pick another one. <laughs> but but you're, you're at least on the right track because, like, it, as long as we're in the realm of the Elder Scrolls, uh, Hermaeus Moro would be more closer to a Lovecraftian being when it comes to okay. Skyrim characters. Gotcha. I I don't I I've I've 
played a lot of Elder Scrolls, and I don't know why that didn't just click in my head as wrong. But, <laughs> <laughs> but like, but it's clear, but it's clear, like a lot of those like like fantasy things also took some inspiration from. Oh yeah, Mo- Lovecraft. Lovecraft is everywhere in pop yeah. culture. It doesn't even just have to be horror. It can just be sci-fi in general, fantasy. Lovecraft uh, has his tentacles in everything. <laughs> <laughs> I love he has his tentacles in everything. It's very ominous and, and weird. <laughs> there. So speaking of like popular culture, then there is one you were talking to me about. There's a there's a movie that either it came out or it's coming out. The uh, Color Out of Space, which is um, I've I've heard from a lot of people is one of their favorite stories yes. from that mythos so so what is that about what what does that who does that center center around so the the color out of space uh which the movie is out now uh okay i forget all the different services that you can rent or stream it on but it is out now i'll i'll, I'll do like a thing like here and then they'll know <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, star starring nicholas cage and directed by richard stanley it is a fantastic film uh with mm. the color out of space is arguably my most favorite lovecraft story and i'm very happy with how the film adaptation turned out that's uh, good that doesn't happen a lot <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it is a very rare thing they, they obviously uh kind of modernized it a bit but it, mm. but the way they did it i think was perfectly fine the the time period that it takes place in isn't as important as that feeling that it gives. Mm. And that was what I was most worried about is that they weren't going to be able to capture that feeling of that constant increase in dread and horror and Mm. tension, but they did it absolutely flawlessly. Uh, The color out of space uh, follows the story of the Gardner family who lives in the middle of Massachusetts and they're just going about their normal life. And then one night, a meteor crash lands onto the property, and they obviously are kind of shaken by this, and uh, they call in some of their friends to see what they should do with it, and they call experts from the nearby Miskatonic University, and they get scientists out there to come and look at it and take samples. And the weird thing they note about this meteor is that It has these little globules inside of it that no one can describe because they're shining very brightly in a color that no one has ever seen before. It is a entirely new color as if if we're looking into a part of the light spectrum that should not be visible yet clearly is. So they start taking these samples back but the samples start disappearing overnight and the meteorite starts shrinking of its own accord and then suddenly disappears altogether. Shortly after this, all of the crops on the Gardner farm start growing to ridiculous proportions and it looks like the harvest is going to be absolutely fantastic. But once everything is harvested, everyone suddenly notices all the food is completely inedible and tastes like ash. Shortly after, all the plants start withering and turning gray and becoming brittle. All the animals start getting sick. All the people start getting sick, and they, too, start to shrivel and turn gray and eventually start falling apart themselves while now exuding that same ominous glow in a color that no mortal eye has ever seen. And before long, when when everyone's has now died as a result of this and the the people who are still trying to investigate this come to the farm they now notice that the glow is now entirely concentrated within the well on the farm and when they try to approach it this massive column of light shoots up from the well and starts spiraling up into the night sky to beyond the point where they can't see and then departs And as it leaves, it just blasts everything around the property. So everything that had already been withering and decaying is now just completely powderized 
And there's just this massive swath of land that is now called the Blasted Heath where nothing can grow and nothing can live. But now everyone's frightened because when this being made entirely of color shot up into space, there was one part of it that, as it was leaving, kind of stopped in midair and then floated back down into the well and no one's ever seen it come back out. And everyone's now afraid that something is still down there and is just waiting to start corrupting some other place nearby. But luckily for everyone, there's a dam that's going to be built that's going to flood the entire area underwater, and they're hoping they'll never have to see anything (laughs) ever again. (laughs) Wow. Sounds sounds, like a thing that'll work. So everyone's now living with this... This dread of there is something unnatural, otherworldly on this land that we don't know where it went, uh, but we're going to try and cover it up with this massive reservoir. But are we? But now nobody even wants to drink the water from the reservoir. So now it's just this right. constant fear of what is that thing and where is it and who's next. Right. So in the story, was there like a be- being associated with that? Like, is it a named being, or is it just some like, like it, it a, is like a, a being, color? but it has no given name. The the being okay. itself is just it's not like a gaseous being. It's not a solid being. It's like something in between. It's just the being only is visible to us as just this embodiment this. of a shifting color that we can't describe. Yeah. So, so that, so you, so you'd call that your your favorite story. That yes, uh, my, my description of it uh, pales in comparison to sure. what you can get out of the actual work. But I absolutely love the color out of space, probably more than any other Lovecraft story. Okay, what, so then, so then, if that's your favorite story, then I guess what my my next question then is: what is your what would you say is your favorite named being, like creature? That would probably be Nyarlathotep. Okay, and that's an outer god? Yes, Nyarlathotep is an outer god. Uh, He is known by many names. Uh, He's known as the Black Pharaoh or Nefren Ka. Uh, He is the Crawling Chaos. Uh, Nyarlathotep is very unlike the other outer gods and great old ones in that he takes a very keen interest in human affairs. He often willingly shows himself to people in various disguises, uh, but he likes to interact with humans. And he likes to interact with them because he gets great enjoyment out of causing suffering and in spreading (laughs) madness. He yeah, could, that sounds uh, right. I, I believe one guy put it best when he described uh, Nyarlathotep as basically Nyarlathotep is to humanity as Joker is to Batman. Nyarlathotep mm-hmm. could easily just destroy humanity, but he doesn't want to because he's mm-hmm. having too much fun toying with us. <laughs> okay. We are okay. merely his playthings. Gotcha. Do do they have like so like a lot of the stories like are you know centered around these beings or these goings on a lot of them are centered around like the old ones are there like aside from are there like big stories that are centered around the outer gods um like that focus on them pretty pretty heavily Uh there are some who like focus on them more than other aspects but the outer gods themselves are very rarely uh make a direct appearance because to do so would kind of lessen their horror. Because right. the whole, like, while the great old ones can serve, uh, serve the role as the big bad very well, as, like, something concrete that you can see and try to maybe not defeat, but thwart or set back mm-hmm. in some small way, the outer gods are just this unknowable, omnipresent threat that defies all human perception and Mm. ability to understand it's just the very idea of them and what they represent and what they drive people to do or not do that is the real threat okay 
So basically it's one of those things where it's like they very, 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 very rarely show up when they do. It's like a big fucking deal. Yes. Like there'll be gotcha. mentions made of them, but very rarely will an outer god actually show up in a story in a manifestation. Gotcha. And there's, there, so there's like, uh, there are so many, like I was reading a list earlier and it's just like, there are so many, um, old ones and like everything like that. How many outer gods are there? That's are a there hard a one to them? pin down okay. uh, be, because so many people keep adding to the mythos as, as gotcha. new stories get written and old ones get revised. Like I was saying earlier, canon is a, a very hard thing to pin down with the mythos. Sure. There, there's like a few that people can always agree on, but then there's always you know new ones being added as time mm-hmm. goes on. So what would you what would you call like the few that people do agree on? So the big one, the the one that nobody doubts is Azathoth. Right. He okay. is known by several names such as the Blind Idiot God, the Demon Sultan, uh, the Mad Piper, uh, the Dreaming One. Azathoth is basically the end all be all. The universe exists because of Azathoth. Okay. The the main theory with Azathoth is that everything that exists in that we've ever seen in the observable universe and beyond, including ourselves, uh, is all just part of Azathoth's dream. Because Azathoth is in an eternal state of slumber, and mm. when he was put into his slumber our universe came into existence. And so everything within it, us included, is all just a figment of his imagination. And the moment he wakes up, we're gone. Every, everything is gone. So, so that's okay. why around Azathoth are these lesser servitor gods who constantly play melodies and lullabies, if you will, but in a horrific tone that we we would consider just garbled noise, but they constantly play this music to keep him asleep because if he wakes up, even they will die. So they don't want to die. So they try to keep him asleep as long as possible. So, so you said that, so you said that he was put into a slumber. Was he, he was put into a slumber by something else. That or, is very vague. Not much okay. is known. <laughs> okay. Different stories give different reasons. So it, it's up to whichever author you want to consider the ultimate authority on it. Sure. I, I, my, my, my argument would be Lovecraft. <laughs> that's, that's just me. <laughs> well, even Lovecraft himself didn't give that many details sure. on why he's asleep. Okay. He just gotcha. is. He, he, it's not he just for napping. us to understand. He just napping out here, out here in the universe, vibing. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so then, what are what are some of the other ones, like kind of like around him that are like? Uh, Shub Nagurath is a good one. Yes, I have heard of that one. Yes, yeah, Shub Nagurath. Uh, there's not that much that's written about her. But she is easily, within terms of the mythos, the most widely worshipped by earthly cultists. Because Shub Nigurath basically would be the equivalent of a fertility goddess or a mother goddess in some twisted form in the mythos. Gotcha. Okay. So she is always kind of worshipped in some aspect by almost every culture. What are some? What are some other? Ones? So, how many? How many would you say are like very commonly agreed upon? Agreed upon beyond uh, those two? the the three, the like the big three that no one doubts are Azathoth, uh, Shavnigurath, and Yarlathotep. Okay, Yarlathotep just, kind of acts just, like the the messenger of Azathoth, but since gotcha. Azathoth isn't really conscious, Yarlathotep basically kind of gets away with doing whatever he wants. <laughs> he just kind of fucks off and does whatever. <laughs> Basically, yes. He's like, Dad's asleep. I'm going to do what I want. <laughs> don't wake Dad, literally. Don't yes. wake don't Dad. Don't wake Daddy. <laughs> we talked about Cthulhu, then back to the back to the old ones. We talked about Cthulhu. Um, we talked about talked about Haster. And then I made that uh, that uh, that fun little Skyrim uh, Elder Scrolls <laughs> jaunt. So what are some other pretty popular uh, old ones? 
Uh, so you've got creatures like uh, Ithakwa, uh, also called the Windwalker, uh, who I forget who he's supposed to be kind of like a direct descendant of. Uh, I think he... Oh, I forgot to mention uh, another uh, outer god that's also mm-hmm. very prominent, uh, Yogg-Sothoth. Oh, is yeah. Also, is also one How that, did you forget Yogg-Sothoth? <laughs> uh, my up? mind was thinking about so many other things in tangents mm. and... But uh, yeah, yeah, this no, is this is this is a subject that could go off into a lot of different directions. Oh so yes, <laughs> As that, that was pure sarcasm. Tab. By the way, the how could you forget? I was like pure. Oh yeah, me, yeah. just being like you know, of course, Yogg-Sothoth. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Yogg-Sothoth is kind of like the one who, if Azathoth is the great creator and destroyer, but who isn't active in anything. Mm-hmm. And is forever in slumber until some predetermined point. Yogg-Sothoth would basically be like Azathoth if he were conscious. Yogg-Sothoth is all-knowing, all-seeing, omnipresent. He's everywhere and nowhere, knows everything that ever happened, is happening, will happen. And Yogg-Sothoth is often referred to as the gate and key because he is almost as widely worshipped as Shubnigurath. And mm. he's so widely worshipped because he freely grants knowledge of hidden things to humans. And he also uh, opens gates and doorways to other realities and other worlds for people. And he generally, it's not like he reserves these things for people he deems worthy or something. Yogg-Sothoth doesn't care. He's like, oh, you want it? Okay, have fun. <laughs> your your brain's gonna melt, but go ahead. That's your problem. <laughs> I read. I read this. I, it's actually really funny that this popped up for me again today as we were going to record this. But as this like um, Tumblr thread that I've seen around the internet several times, where it's just like, like we can't imagine uh, summoning some type of crazy eldritch horror like like a Yoxathoth or a Cthulhu or something like that, but. Imagine if, like, a bunch of ants outside your house formed a giant circle and started chanting your name. You'd be curious about that, too. And then you start solving problems for them that are simple, like bring me sugar or, or you know, do the cube of sugar or something like that. But then an ant says, I want this ant to fall in love with me. How do I make that happen for me? You don't know what to do. So you kill all the other ants except for those two. And the ant is what goes, what have I done? <laughs> And yes, I, I know I think the exact a, thread you're talking about, and that's mm-hmm. a very perfect way of looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, sure, I'll do this thing for you. Again, you're not going to like it. <laughs> it is what it is. I'm giving um, you what you asked for. You can't complain about my methodology. <laughs> <laughs> so then going back to what we were talking about a little bit ago, so you said it was I- Ithaka? Is that what it's? Uh, Ithaka. Ithaka. Yes, the, the Wind Walker. Ithaqua okay. is, uh, in the lore, uh, the inspiration for the legend of the Yeti, or the Wendigo. Oh, Because okay. Ithaqua is this, you know, massively tall, pure white, unhuman, apish-looking creature with red glowing eyes that wanders the Arctic wastes and kills lone travelers and things like that. Uh, you have... Other lesser beings like uh, Sathagwa, who is a creation of, I want to say, Robert Block, but that could be wrong. And Sathagwa is this kind of, he, he looks like a massive, like double human sized toad with black fur and these, and uh, like a nearly human face who, like, relishes in driving humans into conflict and he feeds off that conflict and the bodies of the slain and things mm-hmm. like that. And there's just there's so many different variants of old ones that it's it's hard to pin down how many there are. Mm-hmm. Uh but like Cthulhu being one, Sathakwa, Ithakwa, there is there's some debate whether Haster counts as a great old one or an outer god depending on mm-hmm. who you ask. Gotcha. And, and I myself have a hard time distinguishing that with him. It, it's a blurry line sometimes with mm. a lot of them. <laughs> I mean, that's fair. I mean, I guess, I guess if you think about it, you have these like, these like great unknowable beings. And so like, 
how would you make the distinction if you're just like a human that sees them from the outside of what they are? So that makes sense. So I guess, so I guess to bring it kind of down to the human level, then you mentioned this name a little bit earlier, but you have uh, Miskatonic University, Mm -hmm. um, which I, I, I know a little bit about just kind of from like a little bit from the, from the board games and just some light reading. Um, where and what is Miskatonic University? So Miskatonic University is situated in the city of Arco, uh, which uh, initially, when Lovecraft uh, made up the city for uh, his stories, Arkham was supposed to kind of be this stand-in pseudonym for Salem. But eventually, gotcha. over the course of his writing, Arkham developed into its own unique fictional city, and Miskatonic University sits at the heart of it. Is uh, it is is Arkham is Arkham like in Massachusetts, or is it like just it's like we don't know where where it's at? Uh, it's in Massachusetts. There's okay. a there's actually like within the Call of Cthulhu role playing game, there's like even a map that'll show you where Arkham is supposed to be. <laughs> about like 40, 50 miles north of Boston on the okay. banks of the fictional Miskatonic River, uh, right okay. north of Salem, Massachusetts. Gotcha. Would you, because I, I, I'm noticing a lot because you said that Lovecraft was from Rhode Island. I think what I've noticed that a lot of like very important things and important places from his stories are set in like Northeast New England area. Mm-hmm. Would you say that's accurate? Yes, uh, a lot of like Arkham's features and whatnot were modeled off his hometown of Providence. Gotcha. So, like, even though he didn't travel abroad that much, uh, what little traveling he did was kind of condensed to the New England area. So he was very fond of that area, and he knew it well. That makes sense. So, that, so what do they? So, what do they do at Miskatonic? So, Miskatonic University uh, functions as an almost Ivy League level college. And the, the key draw at Miskatonic University is usually uh, the library on the campus, which houses a very vast and very restricted collection of ancient texts of occult nature. And these are usually the cause of a lot of weird things that go on in Arkham itself. <laughs> so a lot of problems in town usually end up getting traced back to the university, <laughs> who often then has to try and hide away and cover up all these ridiculous otherworldly scandals to maintain their appearance. <laughs> are there places that, like, I mean, I guess there probably are, but, like, within the mythos, are there places that, like, specifically research like what's happening or would is that also miskatonic university or like what what are some other like organizations that kind of exist within the mythos that focus on uh there's there's very rarely like dedicated organizations in the mythos that like actively research it it's usually the some poor lone fool who just happens upon a, se- a series of, you know, diary entries and news reports and starts connecting the dots to these weird things that keep happening and suddenly they realize the full magnitude of what's going on and they're usually doomed by the end of it. There, We are led to believe there are, like, certain organizations that kind of have an idea of what goes on beyond man's understanding and kind of realizes that, you know, we're not alone and that there are other realities, but those aren't really touched on a lot. But, like, there are other locations that are mentioned in the stories where there are, are people who are fully aware of these other realities and these other beings. One of these places that isn't, like, and I know this place because of the original Call of Cthulhu game, but I think one of the other places I know of is Innsmouth, which is this, like, fishing town. Um, in Massachusetts, that like a lot of fish people show up at. What's going? What's going on with yes. Innsmouth? <laughs> so, <laughs> Innsmouth, uh, from Lovecraft's story "The Shadow Over Innsmouth," probably one of, if not his most famous story. Uh, basically, the the TLDR version of "Shadow Over Innsmouth" is that Innsmouth prospered as a fishing town, mm-hmm. and 
Obed Marsh was this captain who was able to constantly bring in great bounties from the sea and often uh, even found uh, gold and would trade for gold with uh, different people that he set out to see and traded with. Uh, like he would, he wouldn't just like fish in the area. He would like go out to sea proper on these larger fishing vessels and would go to like the Azores and all the way out to the Philippines. And he'd travel the world and make all these trades and he'd come home with great wealth and spread that around the town. But he started encountering misfortune and his wealth began to dry up and he was no longer able to provide for the town in the way that he had until he discovered that on a reef off the coast of Innsmouth called Devil's Reef, he discovered the existence of a race called the Deep Ones. And the Deep Ones are these aquatic amphibia, amphibian reptilian human hybrids who are biologically immortal. And they Oops. struck a deal with Marsh that, you know, we can provide you with gold and we can provide lots of fish for your people if you agree to let us come out of the water every so often and have children with your townspeople. And Obed Marsh agreed to this and uh, eventually started getting more and more people on board with this. And so the people of Innsmouth started having these uh, deep one hybrid children who, as they grew, would start to morph more and more into deep ones and take on more fish-like appearances until they eventually uh, would go out to the ocean to live with the Deep Ones in their hidden city. So The Shadow Over Innsmouth is the story about the, a man who comes to the town and starts discovering this history of the town. And the townsfolk are very leery of him because they can easily tell who's one of them and who isn't. Mm -hmm. So they start getting very suspicious of this outsider who suddenly shows up starts asking all these questions and starts looking into everyone's history. Asking and all so the questions, making they, statements, they start, <laughs> Yeah, they, they start forming a vigilante mob to hunt him down. And uh, he escapes even as the, uh, the, old, the deep ones start coming out of the water themselves to try and find this guy. And he escapes from the town and alerts the authorities as to what's going on there who kind of like at first dismiss him as a freaking lunatic, but yeah. they eventually also figure that out themselves. And so the federal government comes and raids the town and sends everyone there like off to military camps. And they send the Navy out to the reef and start torpedoing the reef, trying to destroy the, the underwater city that the deep ones have. And after all this dust clears, the, the narrator of the story, unfortunately finds out that uh, doing some genealogical research, uh, he is a uh, Innsmouth hybrid and will soon Ooh. begin the transformation himself. Is this not is this not what that original Call of Cthulhu video game was based on that story? Oh, uh, the Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth? Yeah, that yeah. one was very, very heavily centered on the shadow over Innsmouth. Yeah. Did you, did you play or um, like do anything with the one that came out a couple years ago? Uh, well, there was uh, there were two games that came out. There was uh, one that was simply titled Call of Cthulhu, mm -hmm. and then and there was the one and then there about. was one that was uh, the Sinking City. But uh, okay. the the so, Call of Cthulhu game is also very heavily draws themes from Shadow Over Innsmouth as well, okay. but it kind of has its own uh, separate story. Okay, and then what? What is the? You said the other one was called the Sinking City. Mm -hmm. What is that one based on? Uh, that one, like so many, like every time there's a Lovecraft game, it's like the the first theme that it's clear they drew from is Shadow Over Innsmouth, be sure, because again, like it's the that's most popular the, one. That's the story that know. everyone knows. That's sure. the one that most people have read. So like the Sinking City occurs in this town in insert nondescript. Uh, New England location here <laughs> where there, there was a terrible storm that came through and a series of massive earthquakes 
that basically caused the entire city to start sinking beneath the waves. And this investigator goes into the town because he's been having these strange dreams and nightmares that have been drawing him to come to this town to try and figure out the source of his problems. So he arrives there and starts figuring out, you know, the, this weird occurrence of the entire town sinking into the ocean and is also trying to research that and see how that fits into the issues he's having. And then there's, you know, a million side quests you can do in addition to that main storyline, which, uh, I think they did, I think they did okay. I still haven't like gone through and like beat the actual main mission. I've just mm. been tinkering around with side missions here and there. Cause like, especially like combat portion of the game is super clunky. So when you, so mm. when you're forced into a fight, it just feels awful, but uh, okay. <laughs> it, it kind of kills the mood a bit. But overall, I think it's okay. If there was one story that you wish somebody would successfully adapt into um into a video game let's just let's say video we'll do video game we'll do movie and then we'll do your choice of media uh in that in that order so video game what do you think a, a good story that has not been tapped into would be to adapt into a game say for a game that that's going to be tricky cuz i think like the tricky thing with lovecraft stories and trying to adapt them into either a video game or a movie is that the ideas and the concepts of Lovecraftian horror are very hard to evoke solely by visuals. So it's very hard to like get that existential dread uh, evoked in a series of images where oftentimes words can do better uh, cause, uh, how does one convey, for example, the, the feeling of, you know, uncovering the knowledge that there are these unknowable, monstrous, trans-dimensional beings who could right. blink our, our, everyone we've ever known in this entire planet or universe even out of existence just by waking up On from a, a wind, nap. Yeah. That right. this being isn't even aware we exist and they can just cause our entire species genocide without even thinking. Mm-hmm. How, how do you deal learning with that <laughs> fact? What do you do with the sheer hopelessness of your right. yourself and the human race in that context? Because that's the, that is the thing. Cause like a lot of media, modern media and just media in general, um, kind of like, rests on this idea that like you have your arc and then the ending is like you know successful you were successful but like with this it's kind of just like there's not really success yes. or victory <laughs> when it comes to these kind of things so you, it's kind you of a hope big, to come out alive that right, is the that's hope. your that's your victory is that you don't die whether you're sane yeah. or not is another story as if right, you can exactly. make it out alive, you've won. <laughs> right. So, so that, so yeah, so I can understand why that would be a little tricky. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I guess, like, I guess, I guess the question becomes, like, in theory, like, what would you, what would you say? Like, if, if they could find a way to do it, what would you think would be, like, a good playable one, a good one to watch? Uh, well, if we if we could just get them to do anything besides Shadow Over <laughs> Innsmouth for a game, Smith. that would be a good start. <laughs> um, <laughs> I yeah. would. I'd I'd love to see. I think maybe Dreams in the Witch House for a game. Okay. Maybe that would be an what's interesting a, one. What's like a like a elevator pitch for that one? Or not elevator pitch, but like your your summary so dreams in the witch house is about a guy who is studying the arkham witch trials of the 1690s and Mm. he's so obsessed with studying this that he's found the house where an accused witch used to live in town the house still stands and is used as a boarding house even though the house itself is almost 250 years old by this point uh, it was built in the, in the 1690s or slightly earlier. So he goes, finds out where this confessed witch used to live and stays in this house because he tries to like 
get inside her head and her mental space, but starts uncovering over the course of time that during as soon as the her trial the, the, for this witch, Kaziah Mason, and when her trial was concluded and she was sentenced, she just straight up disappeared. But she had also, in, in the the papers for the minutes of the trial, had confessed to everything she had done and went into great detail about how she had found a way to break through to a fourth dimension and found a way through communing with these outer beings how to travel through different realities and get favor from these elder gods. And so this guy, in addition to just trying to get inside her head and... Fi- while he's trying to write this story about her, also starts discovering the same secrets she had figured out. And he, too, starts to travel between planes while he's drifting. And basically, by the end of it, has unwittingly made a deal with Kaziah Mason and Nyarlathotep himself to serve Azathoth, just as Kaziah had. And he huh. ends up... Uh, disappearing just as she did, but is declared dead by everyone in the town. Uh, yeah. That, that one's a little that harder to go into because like, especially like the descriptions of the dreams for, yeah. uh, it's, it's very interesting watching the, I think that was one of Lovecraft's best attempts at like describing how another dimension would look to us. It was yeah. very entertaining and stretched my brain a bit. <laughs> But I, yeah, I would love to see basketball. someone's attempt at taking that and making that a game and trying to represent those vivid visuals that Lovecraft wrote down for how this other dimension functions and or doesn't function like we would expect. Nothing's the same from one second to the next and all this impossible geometry that you try to wrap your head around that would just break your brain if you were to look at. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see someone try and build a map around that. I, I want to see gameplay. How do you use like this yeah. bizarre, endlessly shifting dimension to your advantage? How do you warp that environment to your will? Yeah. Or I, I don't really know the words I'm trying to use, but <laughs> Lovecraft is yeah, good no, for well, doing I, that. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. I mean, I, I mean, yeah, that I can see why that would be like, like, like really cool. I could like, I don't know. I love like reality bending stuff. Like it just like I want. I just break break my brain, Daddy. Please. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, this is a beginner's guide, so I think we've talked about you know quite a bit of stuff. And last time we recorded a video, I said, "Hey Zach, would you be willing to do a tarot reading for me?" But in this particular instance, I um, I don't have any spare blood or or dead bodies <laughs> around for for I can't uh, for summon summoning. an old one for you. <laughs> right. So. I guess I guess I'll let you ha- like if you could if you could tell somebody who has sat through this video and is still unsure if they want to read the works or get into the works of H.P. Lovecraft and that's ex- his extended you know the authors that have been influenced by him. What would you tell a person? Like, what's just like a quick like why why should I care? I would say if someone is unsure whether they would like Lovecraft and his works. I I would say if you're a fan of Stephen King, if you're a fan of Edgar Allan Poe, if you're a fan of the Alien franchise, if you're a fan of basically any kind of modern horror story or thriller, odds are you are going to like Lovecraft because... He's kind of the one who revolutionized modern horror as we know it. Mm. He is, if you can get past the very old formal way he spoke in, you know, sentences that ran on through 20 commas and three semicolons and a few ellipses, (laughs) if you can get past that endlessly long-winded way of talking that so many authors did back then, and you can just take that story for what it is. And even still today, they hold up very well. I think most people will find that there's going to be a story that they can relate to. Even if, you know, there's 
a dozen ones that they can't quite wrap their head around or they can't get that vested into, there's always a story for someone in the Cthulhu mythos that can draw them in. Yeah. And um, and again, like you said, it, he influenced so much of modern horror that if you wind up getting into his stories, you'll absolutely see something that you're familiar with inside of it. Oh, so yeah. Think, like, for example, like yeah. the most recent example in media besides uh, Color Out of Space, uh, the movie Prometheus. That, yes, yeah. that movie is basically a plot point for plot point telling of Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness. To, yeah, to the point another, where uh, Guillermo del Toro, who's been wanting to make At the Mountains of Madness for decades, when Prometheus came out, basically went, well, shit, someone's already done it now. I can't they do it anymore. They just put another name on it. <laughs> They just put a different name on it, but that is at the mountains of madness. <laughs> All right, Prometheus is good. I like. It. Yes, a lot it of people is. have have uh, opinions about Prometheus. And I happen <laughs> to enjoy it quite a bit. I, so. I saw it for what it was, and I was in love. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, Zach, uh, thank you so much for coming back and, and talking about this with me. It's the it's kind of like the a perfect thing to talk about in this in this you know month of, of spooks and scares and things of that nature. So I appreciate you uh, coming back and talking to me about no, it. Well, it's my pleasure to be given the chance to rant and go on long winded tangents <laughs> about stuff I like. <laughs> Absolutely. And again, like I said, like I said last time, like I'll say again this time, you're welcome back anytime to, to talk about this kind of stuff. So I will absolutely be reaching out to you again at some point. You know, I will. <laughs> I look so. forward to it. <laughs> uh, and on that note, normally I, you know, you know, I, I find ways to uh, end the video just by like pushing my hand onto the screen. But this time, I'm going to let my friend Cthulhu help me. And um, 